sure. <laughs> but speaking of cool stories, you have a wonderful story. There's so much going on. I want to begin our journey with this question. You know, four years ago, we were getting a handle on this global pandemic, which really sent ripples through everything in our lives. How did you get through that time period and how did it change you? That's a great question. So the pandemic was a really funny time, wasn't it? So, you know, we, we started to hear little um, whisperings of something that we didn't understand. And all of a sudden, everything shut down. Mm -hmm. And we were sort of blindsided as not just a nation, but as a world. Yeah. And so when you're blindsided, the first thing you try to do is make sense of it all. You try to take your frame of reference and somehow wrap it around what's happening to make it make sense. And so that was, you know, just like so many people did that, you know, I did it too, right? That's, that's exactly what my husband and I tried to do. We said, okay, in our frame of reference, we have the only thing we've seen that matches that is this movie Contagion right? Have you yeah. ever seen Contagion, Joe? <laughs> you know, I saw something during the pandemic that was like what we were living and I was like, this is too real. I can't do it. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, so, right. So Contagion um, was a movie. I think it starred Gwyneth Paltrow, Matt Damon. Okay. And really it was the pandemic um, acted out. We, when my husband and I watched it, we literally couldn't believe the parallels. It was like seeing people, you know, buying out toilet paper and water and all of these things. And the only frame of reference that we can make to what was happening was contagion. Yeah. And when you are in a moment of crisis, extreme crisis, where you can't wrap your brain around it, the only thing you can try to do is reach for whatever's familiar. Yeah. So what we did is, you know, we went just like everybody else. We stocked up. Um, we listened to the news, right? You try to get your updates there. And we pulled on the only resources we had, which was staying in the present and trying to stay calm. Yeah. Because we, you don't know in a pandemic, obviously, from moment to moment, when you see that ticker on the bottom of the news screen about the death tolls and what's happening, the only thing you can think of is, you know, what next? And the only thing you can think of is how would I survive or how would I try to do something with this? Should this impact someone I know? Should this come closer to me? Um, from an emotional perspective, the only way that we were able to hold it together is to stay present. Yeah. It's the only thing you could do. I realize I have a son who's on the spectrum and special needs, and I've realized the only real thing that you can do in this life that you're in control of is how you love and take care of those around you. And obviously, in your capacity as a, as a speaker and a coach and a diversity executive, there's all of those things that probably you have to instill in your client base. So I'm curious. Let's get to the brass tacks of what you do right now in 2024. I'm going to put you in front of a bunch of third graders. It's career day. And one of the kids is curious and says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? That's a great question. I love your questions, Joe. Thank I you. love it. Um, so for, for a child, I would say I help people who are really stressed out, really experiencing um problems feeling like life is too much and I help that person calm down feel better and I'm simplifying it as much more complex right. like that, uh -huh. uh, than that so that they can love their life again and not feel so um not not feel like it's too much yeah yeah, I get it. That's what I they, would tell a third grader. They would understand that. So I'm going to put you in that third grade position. What did you want to be when you grew up? What did I want to be when I grew up? Uh, <laughs> it's funny. I'll tell I'll tell a cute story um, that I still have to this day. My, my parents saved a little note that I wrote when I think when I was about seven or eight. And I said, I want to be a pizza maker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I don't want to be a pizza maker, which means I don't want to be a chef. Yeah. Um, but growing up, I always wanted to be a writer um, simply because I was naturally very, very good at poetry. 
Um, it would just literally come to me. I, I would sleep and I would have dreams and I would wake up in, with a poem. It was the strangest thing. And as I got older, I would win poetry contests and things like that. And so everyone naturally thought I was going to be a writer. Um, they thought I was going to be Oprah Winfrey. As a matter of fact, my friends call me Little O. <laughs> Little O. And I got journalism scholarship. And I went to college on a journalism scholarship. However, the strange part is I found out at that time, way back, how, how much journalists made, <laughs> when, which was like at the time, I think $12,000 a year. We're talking like way back, right? Yeah. And then I looked at like marketing. I looked at uh, business and I switched my major to marketing and business administration away from journalism because I was like, how am I supposed to survive off of that? And it sent me on a totally different trajectory that I absolutely love. And also I retain, I, I lost my scholarship, <laughs> but, uh, but I retained my writing. I, I mean, it's, it, we're all of it. We're intersectional beings, right? We're pluralistic. And I still write, I still write poetry and I get to enjoy it in a way that pleases me and with an enhanced nuanced perspective. So growing up, I wanted to be a writer. Yeah. And a poet. The one thing I've been writing poetry for quite a while in my life, decades, I always find it as kind of uh, the poor man's therapy, so to speak, or the poor person's therapy. I mean, it's like you really do get it out when you look back at it. You're like, wow, that's how you deal with it, artistically speaking. You get it out and it's there and you can go back. It's kind of like a, a higher end of journaling, so to speak, but you can let people read it. Yeah. <laughs> Journal and that's a great point. Journaling poetry and journaling and all of those things is allowing us to be the fullest expression of ourselves without judgment. Yeah. When we are uh, able to express our vulnerability to let other people see it, that is when judgment can potentially come in, but it doesn't stop us from that full expression whether or not it's received in the way that we want it to be received, right? We still get to fully express. That's what I love about both poetry and, and journaling. I'm glad you brought up the pay scale in journalism because I dreamed of being a sports broadcaster. I wanted to be in Bristol, Connecticut on the set of ESPN Sports Center. That was my whole dream. And I got in the inside and there was a lot of factors that, that led me out, but I was thinking overarchingly, so many people had ulcers. They were stressed out. There was a lot of yelling going on, a lot of behind the scenes ego stuff. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You mean you want me to live my life going through all of this and I'm going to I'm going to get paid hardly anything? There ain't no way, you know, and, and but but also, too, I think you hit that existential point in your life where you're like, do you want to follow the story or do you want to be the story? Mm. You know, there, there's also that, too. Did you feel like that? Did you feel like you wanted to make your own story versus writing someone else's story? As far as um, being the story, I, I feel that we're always being the story, no matter what choices we make, no matter what direction we decide to go, we are being the story. And I don't think necessarily it was a conscious choice for me. At the time I was, what was I, 18, 19 years old when I changed my major. So I know I wasn't consciously thinking, you know, I don't want to follow the story. I want to be the story. At the time, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to live yeah. off of twelve thousand dollars? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. I I hundred you know? percent get that. You know, in hindsight, as as the adults that we are, then we could look back and say, you know what, that was the point, pivotal moment where the trajectory in a way that was completely unexpected and added so much richness that I couldn't even imagine had I followed the, the path that I intended. Yeah. So you've obviously come into a role in your life where you're helping others. All of these aspects is you helping others get to that place. What were those seeds in Long Island that were planted in you that have grown into who you are and evolved into who you are now? Yeah. Interestingly, in high school, I was, I, I almost beat, I, I resisted it. I was nominated for nosiest, <laughs> nosiest person. And I said, no, I don't want that to be in my yearbook. 
right? And and so it wasn't that I was nosy. I was always, always very inquisitive. I was always curious about people, what made them tick, who they were on a level beyond what you see on the surface. And so when whenever I meet someone, to this day, I absolutely love people um, on a level that um, where I want to know what they're thinking. I want to know what makes them tick. And I always ask the deeper questions, always have. And I didn't know at the time growing up that there was actually a profession that allowed you to do this, uh, <laughs> right? And, and so growing up, I think what molded that is, I don't know if it was my parents, my, my father was always very talkative and gregarious, extremely smart. Um, my mother was always, they were always like a, a fun couple, but I think it was more so the fact that I had to develop my character because growing up, I grew up in a time where being a dark skinned black girl was not popular and I was chubby. I had thick glasses and I got teased a lot. I got teased a lot. And as a matter of fact, um, my best friend, she's my best friend to this day, her prom date refused to have me in the group pictures. And he told her that a week before the prom. And so a week before the prom, she had to ditch her prom date and I gave her mine. And I had to take a friend's brother because I didn't want her to be without a prom date. And she was just like, no, that's my best friend. So growing up at a time where my looks were very unpopular, I had to develop my character. Yeah. And so I deeply, deeply, admired and respected the people who took the time to develop theirs you know they you see the people who are gorgeous on the surface and then you can go to talk to them and they, they're about as shallow as you know it gets um and I always sought to just dig beneath the surface and I took pride in the fact that I took time to develop my character I took pride in the fact that I was smart yeah um and I took and the fact that I was smart was like a bragging point for my parents and it was a way for me to feel valued and validated. So that, I guess, to, to answer your question, Joe, was a way, um, was part of what formed who I am and my curiosity in others and my passion for seeing the value in others and making other people feel seen. So well said. So let me ask you this. Who was, who was a hero for you? Who was a hero or an inspiration? Mm, um, both my parents were inspirations and heroes. My father was a hero in a way where this man, and, and I love him so much. I, I lost him last year. Um, and I, I was a caregiver for him until he, he went. Um, my father was a hero in that this man was brilliant. Um, he's the type of person who could like beat the machine playing chess. He was very, very brilliant. Um, he was uh, funny and he always was the type of person who would be 100% honest with you, um, regardless of whether it was good or bad. He had that honest, you know, down to earth uh, type of personality and he was fearless. Um, he was a business, he had a bi several businesses and he just moved through life in a way where he just did it his way. So his favorite song was Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. Yeah, That was my dad's song. And that's how he lived. My mother also is an inspiration because she is such a pioneer. Like she will basically move. She at, at 70 something years old, she like picked up and she moved to a new state where she didn't know anybody because yeah. she looked it up and she thought it was cool. So both of my parents are heroes in that they forge paths and they live authentic lives in a way that help me know that if I live authentically, if I take a chance on myself, life can be so rich and adventurous. So they are my true heroes. So if you could meet one person alive on the planet right now that you find fascinating, who would that be? One person alive? Yeah. Oh, that, that's an interesting one. Um, okay, so one person alive who I find fascinating. Hmm. 
that's a really good one. I'll, I'll have to think about that. Okay. All right. Okay. I mean, you could open it up to the ghosts too. So it could be a, a full spectrum if, if that <laughs> needs to happen for sure. So let me ask you this. Of all of the clients that you've helped, what's your favorite client success story? Mm, okay. Um, my favorite client success story is one of my most recent client success stories, right? So I have a client, Eric. Uh, and so what I, what I do for your audience is, is I, I help high stress professionals who are living lives of chronic overwhelm. I help, help them break free from that chronic overwhelm so they can love their lives again. And Eric is um, one of my clients who, I, I don't I don't know if I have to tell you, Joe, but a lot of men are resistant to getting help for many, many reasons that we can go into. Yeah. Eric was resistant initially. Um, he was referred by another colleague who I do executive coaching. He was referred by a colleague who had a really good experience with me. And so he started to work with me. And I work with we worked together for about 12 weeks. And before that, Eric's situation, he, he is a high volume financial manager and his, he wasn't getting any sleep. Um, his sleep quality was horrible. It was, um, we, we measure sleep. So um, prior to his sleep quality, he said he just wasn't sleeping. He would wake up three o'clock in the morning. Um, he would go to bed at around 11, 30, 12. So he was, he was getting like three hours of sleep. Yeah. Um, coping, he had coping mechanisms, heavy overeating. Um, he wasn't really, you know, he and his wife weren't really connecting in the way that, you know, they should have, she felt neglected. He felt less than, um, he was really being put on at work. Um, he, he has a very prominent role, um, really being dumped on at work, um, leadership change, executive leadership changed. And, you know, he was really feeling it. And so when he started to work with me, the words that he used was that I, I finally feel like I have the language to express how I felt. He said, I knew something wasn't right, but he said, somehow now I feel like I have this mental translator to translate what felt like a foreign language in my head. Um, as we started to work together to this day, um, he reported that he has lost 42 pounds since we started to work together. And late last year, I think it was late November, we started working together. He lost 42 pounds. And that was an unexpected side effect because what tends to happen is that when we are overwhelmed and we are, number one, we know something's not right, but we are normalizing it. We are rationalizing it. We're absorbing it. And we're saying, okay, you know, I can handle it because we think anything else is weakness we tend to rely on coping mechanisms, right? We tend to drink or overeat or do anything that could make us feel like we're not feeling what I call a hum, right? So that hum is that feeling that of, of mental restlessness that will not let you feel relaxed or free no matter what you do, right? Yeah. So even if you're smiling, even if you're resting, you're not completely at rest because the thought of all those things that you're mentally juggling is so much that you cannot feel completely at rest and all the guilt and all the obligations of all those shoulds that will not let you rest. So he was feeling that hum big time, right? And so when we feel that hum to drown it out, we try to do a lot of things, yeah. right? We, you know, scroll social media, whatever we can do, but it's not completely gone, yeah. right? So once we were able to really dig beneath the surface, to find out why he was doing it, right? What made him tick? Not this is not about you know go eat a salad and and, and go for a run or anything like yeah, that, right? right? <laughs> we get to the bottom of what makes you tick, right? Why you're doing this, yeah. right? What's underlying it? And peeling back the layers. And once we got beneath the surface of that, he was starting to realize he was like, okay, now his situation didn't change. He's still that prominent high volume finance manager. But the way he handles life now is like he did a complete 180. His yeah. wife feels so much more valued. And the, the 42 pounds that he got off 
was literally, he wasn't even trying. He just didn't realize that he wasn't reaching for coping mechanisms anymore. Yeah. So I, it makes me so happy to hear things like that, especially from men, yeah. especially from men. Because men are just suffering in silos and silence because they believe that they're somehow supposed to hold it all together without help and anything else is a letdown, right? They're, they're, the, they're the strong ones. They're the pillars. They're the posts. But what happens when the post starts leaning? Who's your leaning post, yeah. right? And so this society has taught men to just take it, just suck it up. Yeah. And because of that, things like that are happening to my client, Eric, and, I, and my most, my, the success story of, of his, my most recent one, which is his, that's what makes me happy. That's yeah. what makes me like vibrate. Yeah, that's a great story. So at the end of the day, as the practitioner of helping others, everyone has a perception of you, family, friends, clients, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? What is my perception of me? So my perception of me is in whatever context that I am put in, whatever life throws at me, I am the constant. So what do I mean by that? When, when you're the constant, when you're the constant, you know who you are, you know what you know, you have crystal clarity on what is important for your life, which means that you are able to qualify and disqualify things from your life that do or do not serve you in a way that makes you feel whole all the time. So my concept of myself is that wherever I am, I am the constant and I am tapped into my, my definition of wholeness. Yeah. So I think we've scratched the surface. If anyone out there wants to hire you, learn more about you, reach out, any of the good business, where's the best place to go? The best place to go, people can connect with me directly on LinkedIn at Coach Celeste Stacy. They can also go to my website, which is celestestacy.com. That's Stacy with a C-E-Y. And I'm going to uh, give your listeners a special link. So that's celestestacy.com forward slash hum. H as in happy, U as an umbrella, M as in move. And there you will find out more about those feelings of chronic overwhelm. And you will get to see um, the, the perspectives of people who have worked with me. But it talks about that hum that I talked about of mental restlessness and chronic overwhelm. I love that term. Yeah, I, I totally love it, how you kind of broke it down. Celeste, this has been wonderful. You're wonderful. Thank you for your story. Keep doing the great work and putting the light out there. We need it. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Thank you. It.